Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, incoming executive director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of Alan Price, JFK Library Director, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching today's program online. Secretary Carter kindly agreed to pre-sign copies of his new book before tonight's program, and our bookstore will be selling signed copies if you're interested after the program. We thank you all for taking this opportunity to silence your cell phones. This evening, we are delighted to welcome Ash Carter, the author of Inside, Inside the Five-Sided Box, Lessons from a Lifetime of Leadership in the Pentagon. He served as the 25th Secretary of Defense under President Obama and served in numerous jobs in the Department of Defense over 35 years. He currently serves as the Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School and is also an Innovation Fellow at MIT. I'm also so pleased to introduce our moderator for the evening, David Martin has been CBS News's national security correspondent covering the Pentagon and the State Department since 1993. In that capacity, he has reported virtually every major defense, intelligence, and international affairs story for the CBS Evening News, as well as for other broadcasts, including 60 Minutes and 48 Hours. He has received several Emmy Awards for his re reporting. Please join me in welcoming our special guests for the evening. Thank you. That uh, bio actually makes me seem uh, younger than I am. Um, the, uh, I started covering the Pentagon for CBS News in 1983, and uh, I had covered it for several years before that for Newsweek. So it's about 40 years that I've been uh, covering the Pentagon. Um, that's what uh, Ash Carter would call a legacy system. Uh, something built for the Cold War and repurposed for the uh, wars of the 21st century. I cover the, uh, the Pentagon just by walking around the building and uh, talking to people. And I like to think that I hold the world's record for a number of miles walked in the Pentagon. But after reading Ash's book, I'm no longer so sure that I'm the record holder because he too liked to walk around the building and with all his security clearances, he could go places I can't. <clears throat> he at least walked far enough to identify one problem that's been bugging me for years. And remember where you heard this first, the Pentagon has a severe shortage of urinals. Ah. <laughs> Can I say something about that? <laughs> that, 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 that? First of all, uh, to people who have served in the Defense Department, and my first job was 1981, this is the best reporter of the Pentagon. Everybody knows that David Martin is it. Okay. And I, I, I always say that because it's really important because what we do is serious business and you want it seriously reported. Now that doesn't always mean comfortably reported and sometimes as he walked around he got information we wished he didn't have uh, and he always told the truth even when that hurt and all that. Um, but I just want to tell you that um, uh, it, it means a lot when you're in immediate leadership position when you have people in the press who are as uh, high quality and professional as David. Now in the urinals, however, <laughs> you, you, you'll remember, because you go back far enough, one of the amazing things about the Pentagon's a beautiful, splendorous building and everybody has seen it flying in and out of National Airport and, and most of you looked over and said, oh, I wonder what it's like to be inside of that thing, which is what the book is about. But one thing you can't see any longer are the wondrously sized bathrooms that it used to have. Yeah. Um, yes. And they, when I started working there, I was amazed. 
there were two on every corridor, and you went in, and there were 25 urinals down one side, male, male side, now 25 uh, stalls on the other, and 25 sinks, you remember. And um, ladies, I presume, same thing. There's certainly one in the same geography on the other side of the uh, uh, hall from every male one. Now, why? The reason is that that was this place was built during World War II, and it was uh, it was a wash with clerks. And we don't need clerks like that anymore. People have email and so forth. And so when it was rebuilt, you know all this, but it was rebuilt after the 9-11 attack, one-fifth by one-fifth wedge. Um, we shrank the bathrooms dramatically, maybe too much. <laughs> Uh, but they were vast, and it was a source of wonder to me when I first, many things were a source of wonder to me, my first job in the Pentagon, the size of the bathrooms. So we promised you a good discussion about <laughs> national security. <laughs> uh, so regardless of, of who the uh, record holder is in, in Miles' uh, walk, uh, there's almost no question that Ash Carter knows more about the Pentagon than anyone alive. As a scientist, he knows how the weapons work, and as an executive, he knows how the building works. And he is the only person to have held the top three jobs. Secretary for Acquisition, which is the, uh, basically the chief uh, weapons officer. Uh, weapons officer, the chief weapons buyer. The, uh, the book he's written, a lot of it deals with the Obama administration because that's when he's served, but it is as much a tutorial about how the Pentagon works or doesn't work as it is a, uh, a memoir. So we've got him now for uh, an hour and a half, which is about three hours longer, I mean three, three times longer, than we ever used to get you when you were Secretary of Defense. So I hope to uh, make the most of it. And I want to, I want to uh, start uh, on the news. On Friday, uh, President Trump pardoned three servicemen who were accused and in two cases convicted of war crimes. Before making that decision, he consulted the Secretary of Defense. What would your advice had been to him. I, I'm guessing that now I have to judge from the outside looking in. Um, but I believe my advice would have been the same that I think the current Secretary of Defense was, which was to stick up for the military justice system. It's very hard from the outside in to know uh, in a particular legal case what the right outcome was. So unless you have a problem of principle with uh, the law being applied, which I don't in this case, or you believe that there was some um, uh, violation of uh, proper process and protocol and so forth, one, you have to let the military justice system work. It worked in this case, and I would not have interfered with it. I certainly wouldn't have advised the president to interfere with it. So one thing these uh, cases all had in common was that their supporters took to Fox News to uh, argue that these men were being persecuted for decisions they made in the heat and chaos of, sure. of uh, combat. So now that they've been pardoned, what is the message that sends to the troops? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a message of disrespect for the justice system. And, you know, David, I always used to tell people I make no apologies for this, the, for the fact the United States takes its values to the battlefield. Um, it's part of what we represent uh, as a country, but it's also part of the ethos of, our, of the troops. Um, and uh, so when we make a mistake, which we do, and I remember getting on our, the airplane, which you traveled with me, 
numerous times on the E-4B out at Andrews Air Force Base. The morning, the, I'm not sure you were on this particular trip, but we were uh, attacking a hospital, oh, yeah. a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, by mistake, obviously, but there's, I mean, just hammering it for a whole hour. That was awful. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that were we the Russian military or the Syrian military, you might sweep under the rug. That's not the way we behave. Um, and in that case, there was, there, there's no conceivable excuse you can give. It was, a, and it, I accepted responsibility for it. The president accepted responsibility. We found the people who made the mistakes and they were punished appropriately. Um, but that has to be done in front of the world. It also has to be done in front of the force itself because these, these, these kids want to feel that they're on the right side of things, that they're proud uh, of what they do and that uh, they have given themselves to an honorable pursuit, which is the protection of their country uh, and making a, a, a better world for their children. And they really buy that and their moms buy it. Uh, and their spouses and their kids buy it. And we've got to stand for that whole thing. Um, so uh, it, the message it sends is not the message that the leadership sends, but it's also not the message that their, their, their families are sending to them, and it's not the message that their heart is sending to them either. So I know how this happened, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. They were charged with something that is against everything we stand for and by a legal system that uh, behaved the way we built it to behave, they were found guilty, uh, uh, period. And this is one of these things, David, that you, we shouldn't be messing around in. I'm getting a little ahead of the story here. One of the points I make in the book is when you're running a large, in this case, the largest institution in the world, you have essentially two responsibilities. One is to lead it forward into where it may not want to go. And you, people are, can be stodgy. They can be used to doing things a certain way. They can be unwilling to face the future. They can be frightened and so forth. And you want it, you have to drive, in this case, the military, so it's, it's not living in the past. Uh, and it ha uh, uh, represents the best of modern technology and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing you have to do is stick up for what it's already good at. Mm -hmm. And I only say that because we live in a society in which there's so much demolition going on of things that took a long time to build. It's so hard to build things in public life. And it's so easy to take them apart. You mentioned the, uh, the size of the... Uh the uh, defense establishment. That's, that's the one thing I never get used to in covering the Pentagon is just how big the defense establishment is. After 40 years, I am still going to bases that I've never been to, and in some cases, I'm going to bases that I've never heard of. And that doesn't count all of the uh, combat outposts that uh, were set up in places like uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. I saw one figure uh, there was an audit released uh, Friday evening. Uh, the Pentagon, the Pentagon's inventory, that's just the stuff sitting on the shelf waiting for somebody to come and requisition a spare part, is six times the size of Walmart's, which is the largest, of course, retail operation in the world. So continuing on current news, the current Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper has just been to Korea. And one of the things he was charged with doing while, while there was beginning negotiations with the Koreans over who will pay what for the cost of stationing American troops there. And he was told uh, by President Trump to increase the uh, South Korean share from roughly $1 billion to roughly $5 billion, 400% increase. What kind of message is that? Uh, well, let me go. The, the message to the South 
Koreans is that we value your having you as an ally less and so need more in the way of, of money. That may be what you're getting at. That may mm -hmm. be the message that the South Koreans take. So lo let me go back to the basics is why are we there in the first place and do we value having them as an ally? Um, and this is a basic question that is, that is being questioned by President Trump and other, other people. Uh, and there seems to be this idea around that allies are, um, al and alliances are favors that we do, to far do for foreigners. That's not the way um, uh, it is. Uh, alliances are force multipliers for us. Uh, they contribute forces and they contribute real estate, that is geography from which we can jump off, uh, that we otherwise, it would otherwise be much more difficult for us to have the same, same capability. Um, so let me remind you, for example, if you want to get out of Syria or you want to get out of Afghanistan, I remind you that the way we got bin Laden was we had a friend in Afghanistan. We, we, if we couldn't have mounted the bin Laden raid out of Jalalabad, which is what we did, we would have had to do it from somewhere. Uh, I'm, I don't think, I don't see how we could have gotten in there. Certainly, we couldn't have gotten in there by helicopter from the, the um, uh, it, unless we were that close. Likewise, Baghdadi, whom we got a few weeks ago, we were able to do that operation actually from northern Iraq, but the same thing. Um, it's not so bad for us to have, if we need to deter and, if necessary, destroy North Korea. South Korea is a good foothold for us. It's not bad geostrategically for us to have a foothold in Asia. Of course, the Chinese dislike that. Um, and the, the South Koreans are a good fighting force. They weren't always that way, as you know, but they've gotten, they've gotten a lot better. Um, and. Uh, as far as basing our forces there, in addition to being it more, it more efficacious, let's suppose you took the forces that were in uh, South Korea and you brought them home. We could do that. Go home, bring, put them in Colorado. You still got to pay them. I mean, the lion's share of the expenses you got anyway. And sometimes the cost, and what generally we ask foreigners to do is pay the marginal cost of having them deployed in their country rather than in the United States. But unless we're going to reduce the, the force overall, it's better for us to have them there and they offset some of the, some of the expense. Uh, so it is just functionally, I'm just saying, as the person who has to win the wars with the amount of money we're, we're given, allies are helpful. And, and number two has to do with values. Um, It, it uh, we fight for our own protection, um, but we also, in the long run, have to fight for our own values also, or we're gonna have to do more and more protection of ourselves. And so our allies are also people that see the world and see security the way we do. There aren't that many uh, anymore in the world. That's valuable, that's another source of strength uh, for the United States. So it's not a gift we give to foreigners. It's in the brutal calculus of winning wars on behalf of Americans, it's a good thing to do. And you've got to be careful about disrespecting people. South Korea's a democracy. Germany's a democracy. You, if, we, if we Americans seem to be disrespectful of another country. It's okay to do hard dealing in a respectful way, that they'll understand. If you seem to be disrespectful of people, and the other countries of democracy, with, mo with which most of our friends are, then the leader of that country can't do what you want him or her to do, even if it makes sense, because it will be too unpopular. You've made doing the right thing by America politically impossible for leaders in their own country. That's, so when you, do, when you do that to, in a dictatorship, you do, do that with China, that's fine, because she can turn on 180 tomorrow. And I'll tell the people one thing one day, and they'll go fine, and then I'll tell them the opposite of that the next day, and they'll go, they'll go fine. That's not true with Germany or South 
Faria. So people are stung. So these things, since they're good for us, you have to tend to them properly. And disrespecting people is not good, good uh, 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 caretaking. Uh, he mentioned the uh, bin Laden raid, and that reminded me I, of a point I neglected to make at the start. When you hold these top jobs, Secretary of Defense, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the decisions you make have consequences for decades after you have left office. In the book, he writes about the uh, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which was just starting to come into the force on, on your watch. Well, the F-35 is going to be around until 2050. So that's, that's how far his reach uh, in these matters extends. But in a more newsworthy vein, the unit that got al-Baghdadi was a unit that he sent to the, uh, to the Middle East. So they were there because of a decision he made in what, 2015? 15. 2015. Um, sticking on Korea for just a second. Another thing that uh, happened as a result of that trip of the Secretary of Defense to South Korea was a, an announcement that they are going to suspend a planned exercise mm. so that they don't uh, tick off North Korea and Mistake. scuttle any chances of any further negotiation. Um, do you think it was given up the exercise that's was a, worth the chance, or no, did we just mistake. give away that's something for nothing? Uh, we have, from time to time, in the course of my professional lifetime, but for the very for the first time in '94, then in '99, then in 2005, six, um, uh, Condi Rice and Colin Powell gave it a stab. We none. Of, it was not done by President Obama at all. He's the first one who didn't try negotiating with the. I just think he thought it was. Uh, not useful, and, I, I don't, and it, this president has decided to negotiate with them, and I'm not arguing with that, that at all, but one thing we never, ever offered them was our exercises, and here's why. The exercises are the way that we in the South Koreans polish and demonstrate our ability to defeat the North Korean armed forces. And if you've ever thought about war on the Korean Peninsula, think about it in the following way. It takes place in the suburbs of Seoul. Uh, we used to think Seoul would change hands twice. Um, that is one of the most densely populated urban environments on Earth. This isn't out in the middle of nowhere. This is in a very densely populated area with an intensity of violence, the likes of which the world hasn't seen since the last Korean War. So it is an ugly baby. And um, we will win, and we will go to Pyongyang, and we'll, we will destroy the North Korean armed forces, and we will destroy the North Korean regime. I'm absolutely certain of that, 100% confident in that. But that's not a war I want to have. And one of the ways that we try to prevent that is to make it abs make what I've just said absolutely crystal clear to Kim Jong Un. Mm -hmm. Don't try it; you will lose. And one of the ways you do that is by conducting exercises. And one of the things that both shows him and it improves your and the South Koreans' capability, so that you really can do it. So we and that's not. That, we need that whether they go forward with their nuclear program or not, David. They still have a conventional military. There can still be a war on the Korean Peninsula. Deterrence is still important anyway. Yeah. So we never, and I never recommend it, I never saw any of my predecessors recommend that we put exercises on the negotiating table. I don't mind other things being on the negotiating table, but we did not put exercises, and I'm, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that my successors would have recommended that either, though I cannot speak for them, for the reason that it constitutes the heart of, the exercises constitute the heart of deterrence. And we can not we can talk to these people, that's fine, but you can't relax on deterrence, otherwise you get a war that is really a grotesque uh, war. 
So for um, those who don't follow this on a daily basis, they, the exercises were uh, originally suspended a, after the uh, first S the Singapore summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. And they were then reconstituted in a less visible way. Um, and people I talked to didn't have a problem with just reconstituting them in a less visible way because there was a lot of show and tell with uh, nuclear bombers flying at low level over Korea, which they would never do in the real world. Um, so is it all right to dial them back? Well, it, that, that was pure symbolism. That was not military functionality. Mm -hmm. the, the flying the, the bombers was, I think, part of the negotiation, and you can ask whether that's a, an effective negotiating tactic. But you're right, it really didn't demonstrate anything. I mean, everybody knows that a, we can fly bombers <laughs> low, and yeah. so what does that show? Um, uh, but it was part of the symbolism of a negotiation. I guess I can understand doing that. I, I, was, I wasn't a big fan of that as a negotiating tag. I don't think it did any harm. But that's different, David, from not having us and the South Koreans out on maneuvers together, figuring out how, if the North Korean army pours through one of those three north-south running valleys that connect North Korea and South Korea, how we're going to, to stop them. That's a functional exercise that's different. So, I, so it, it, the way you describe it, it sounds innocent, like we're only stopping the stuff that doesn't matter anyway. How can I be against that? Well, but if it does matter, I'd be very cautious about throwing it into the negotiations. So the, these, the two big annual exercises have now become what the military calls command posts exercises where you don't have troops out in the field maneuvering, uh, but you've got all the, uh, the chain of command in front of their computers acting as if the troops were maneuvering. And every time a commander of U.S. forces in Korea testifies before Congress and he gets asked, has the readiness been degraded by these exercises, they say no. Are they just towing the party line or uh, I, I, I don't want to explain why they're, they're doing it. It's not ideal to not do full-scale training. We've always done it. We've always said that was important, and it is. I mean, you, the officers can get together in a command center. It's not the same as the troops running the, the, um, the terrain. So I, you're asking me whether I would have recommended it. I would not. So um, let me broaden it out a little bit here. Uh, more than one person has said uh, you would be wise uh, to watch what President Trump does, not what he says. And there are lots of examples of that, and the most recent is uh, the pullout from Syria. Twice, last December and, and just this past month, he has said, I'm pulling all U.S. troops out of Syria. We still have several hundred troops in Syria, and we are likely to have several hundred troops in Syria for the uh, foreseeable future. So if you take away his rhetoric, how different is his policies, let's say in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, how different are his policies from President Obama's? Um, uh, uh, David, I'm going to push on you a little bit about if you take away what someone says and only look at what they do. I don't know why you're going there, but, but, but saying is doing in part when you're President of the United States. And so the, I, the question parses being president in a way that I don't uh, accept. Uh, it does matter what you say as well as what you do. So I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to go down that. that well, don't don't that, accept that the premise. Road. But just. But so let's take Syria for example. Why why are we in Syria in the first place? 
uh, we went into Syria in the first place in this instance um, in small numbers in order to d defeat ISIS. And uh, we largely did, and largely had as of two years ago or so. And except that there are some uh, remnants that are still running down the lower Euphrates Valley and, and uh, a few leaders and so forth uh, running around, but eventually we'll get them and, and kill them also, I think was it. that was always our natural thinking. Uh, our, our, the thinking is part of the plan. Um, our approach to the war was that rather than send Americans in to take Raqqa, which remember was the so-called capital of the so-called caliphate, from which they were planning to kill Americans. And so we had to, we had to get take Raqqa. We could have done that ourselves, but that's not the path we took. That's certainly not the path I recommended, and the president took my recommendation, which w instead it was to recruit a local infantry and then bring down atop them the might of our, of the American tornado. Uh, air power, other kinds of firepower, intelligence, logistics, advising, and so supercharge a local infantry. Uh, that is preferable to doing the infantry fighting ourselves for a few very good reasons. One is that to put an American infantryman in a Middle Eastern city where he or she doesn't speak the language and naturally, however well trained, isn't going to fit uh, right in, uh, puts them in a tactical situation where uh, they're fighting on the enemy's battleground on the enemy's terms. I don't like to do that if I could avoid it. I would prefer to be on our terms than on their terms. Second, if you put Americans in there rather than getting locals, um, many of the local people would have come to view our action against ISIS as an occupation or somehow against them. And some of them who, who fought with us might have fought against us or stood on the sidelines, and that was undesirable. And third, if we had done it ourselves and conquered it, then we would have had the experience we already had in 2003 in Iraq of having conquered a foreign population, which proved complicated. Um, and so for all those reasons, we uh, went with using a Syrian force. That's why we were in there. And that is why fairly small numbers of Americans in situations where they were not um, uh, suffering casualties, anything like, David, what they were at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars of the decade previously, uh, that's why a small group of them not dying in large numbers could be very effective at achieving something we had to do to protect the country. So that's the reason why we're there in the first place. And Erdogan and the Turks complained to me many, many times about us working with the YPG. And I said, I'm sorry, um, but I've got to do what I've got to do to protect my own people, and therefore I'm going to work with the YPG. I'm going to make sure they don't attack you. I know you don't like it, but we're going to have to agree to disagree. Instead, the president, in a phone call with Erdogan, came out of it anyway, saying that he had promised that we would withdraw troops from Syria. I don't know what was he was thinking, uh, but uh, I don't want our troops withdrawn from Syria. I want them to continue to be there in those small numbers in order to make sure that ISIS doesn't come back. Because if you don't like, if you don't want to be in never-ending wars, don't unwin the wars we've just won. You were... <clears throat> You were uh, Secretary of Defense when uh, Russia annexed Crimea, 
correct? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I think I was undersecretary. May have been deputy. I wasn't secretary. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> but I was the, again at the. <laughs> that's where you're going. <laughs> the annexation of Crimea uh, kindled a renewed interest in NATO. Yes. And that included spending a lot more money and sending a lot more troops over there. President Trump badmouths the NATO alliance all the time. But has anything changed in terms of the money spent and the troops sent? Um, uh, uh, well, we did. We introduced some additional forces into uh, uh, Europe. And let's go back to the reason for that. The reason for that is Putin's Russia. Now, I was around when the wall fell and the Soviet Union broke apart into 15 countries. And we had war plans for fighting against the Warsaw Pact. And then we didn't have war, war plan for 25 years, David. We didn't have a Russia war plan until I was Secretary of Defense. I thought that was, no, I'm not, I'm, war plans are how we think through how we would accomplish what we needed to do, in this case, defeating Russia, if, God forbid, that um, became necessary. Now, I want to hasten to add that, that I don't consider that at all likely, and uh, it's certainly not a pleasant duty, but it is a duty. But for 25 years, we didn't have a war plan. Uh, and so for the first time, and this was again in 2015 when I became Secretary of Defense, I said, we need a Europe war plan, and uh, a Europe, I'm sorry, a Russia war plan, and we began to build that plan, and it called for some additional forces, uh, two more brigades in Europe and some different configurations of armor uh, and, and so forth, uh, all units that had been in the United States that were then uh, forward deployed that were a piece of this larger war plan. We need to keep doing that. That's one of the things that we do with NATO is deter Russia. Putin's Russia, which is trouble. I've known Putin since 1993. Because when I went with Clinton to summits with Yeltsin, Vladimir Putin took notes in the back of the room. And you're taking notes on the other side. But he is. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, no, because I wasn't a KGB of the United States. I was actually <laughs> sitting at the table. That's, a diff, 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 that's the difference between him and me. Um, and he's trouble for reasons we can go into, but, and we have to do many things about him, but one of them is to make sure that we have a modern war plan. Uh, for NATO, and that's one of the things we do with NATO because it is mutually beneficial. Now, more generally with NATO, what else do they do with us? They, they came to Afghanistan with us and they performed extremely well. Um, they went to Bosnia. We, all, we did Bosnia together. The day aircraft came, crashed into our building is the only time the NATO treaty has ever been invoked, it was on 9-11. It was invoked for us, an a alliance that was designed to protect them. The first ever instance of that was to, in, in response to an attack on the United States. So, so NATO has a utility to it. Again, it's made up with democ of democracies, and so you have to be careful about how you deal with it. Um, uh, again, uh, yeah, you do worry about money and how you split money when it comes to putting forces over there. I, like every, every one of my successors, or any one of, every one of my predecessors has screamed at the Europeans for, to spend more f for their defense. They're supposed, they should. I'm glad that our president is complaining about that uh, to them, but that's in a long tradition of complaining to the European, uh, European allies. So um, we... So has there been any weakening of NATO? I think there, uh, there by Talking disparagingly of it, it has, as I understand it, undermined some some support in those publics for it. Mm -hmm. And again, 
it can be hard to win that back later. These are democracies, so we need the people to be broadly, at least, supportive of what we want their governments to do, which we want them to do because that is in our interest uh, for them to do it. And, and I, I, that's the reason not to talk too casually about our friendship with them. So I want to test market a, a line on you, see if you agree or disagree. For all his fire and fury rhetoric, President Trump has proven himself to be a very reluctant warrior. Well, he says that. He says it all the, all the time. He wants to end this is the long wars. Watch what I do, not what I say, though, right? Well, that's your theme. <laughs> um, um, and I, I, I actually, it's commendable in an American president not to want to get us into wars. And if we're in wars, to want to get out of war, I don't have any problem. Uh, I don't have any problem with 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 uh, with that, and you're right. The bark is much bigger than the bite. And, mm -hmm. um, so why is everybody tearing their hair out and screaming that he's going to lead us off a cliff? Well, I don't know. You live in Washington and in the Pentagon. I, 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 I don't know. Why don't you ask me something about the Pentagon and not Donald Trump? You, you sit there all day. Huh? I'm here. <laughs> how about I ask you? How about I ask you something about? Uh, President Obama, um, you said that um, he made no uh, disastrous miscalculations during his time in office. What about the decision to withdraw combat troops from Iraq, which? Well, I was I, I made it quite clear in the book. I, I was I was I would not have recommended that. I was not his Secretary of Defense. I think that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, that was a mistake on President Obama's part in my judgment. Obviously, he disagrees with that, but uh, that was in 2013. I think it was one factor that led to ISIS, not the factor, but a factor. History tends to be complicated uh, in that way, and therefore, I think it was unfortunate. Um, one of the most... Uh consequential decisions you made was to open up all combat units to women. Right. Um, that means basically women in tanks, women in, in the infantry, uh, where physical strength, upper body strength, really is uh, something of a factor. Two people who I know you think highly of, Joseph Dunford, who you nominated to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and your successor, James Mattis, mm -hmm. would both be opposed to that. And, and yeah, and, and Joe did. Joe mm -hmm. did in the case of the Marine Corps. He wanted some continuing uh, exceptions. So those two arguably knew more about combat than everybody in this room combined. Why did you not? Well, I don't, I don't want to speak for Jim because I don't, I don't know exactly what Jim said, but I know perfectly well what Joe said. And what Joe's, Joe Dunford, who was coming out of the Marine Corps at the time, asked, was alone among leaders. I asked the chief staff of the Army, the chief staff of the Air Force, the chief of Naval Operations, the commandant of the Marine Corps, the secretary of the Army, the secretary of the Navy, the secretary of the Air Force, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the head of Special Operations Command. I said, everybody write to me and give me their advice. And if you request additional exemptions, tell me why. And they took some time to do that. And us, we being the Pentagon, we studied it very carefully. We did studies. We took surveys of... <laughs> Uh, and so we looked at other militaries, like the Israeli military and uh, others in which women were uh, uh, able to go into all military operational specialties, things like SWAT teams and NASA crews and all kinds of things. So we looked, we thought, we studied it very, uh, very hard. And the only exception, everybody else came back, Special Operations Command, Navy, uh, Air Force said, fine, um, said uh, we can, 
uh, do this, and, and we see and we recommend it because there's some real advantages to it. The advantage being that you put on the table half of the population. Remember, we have an all-volunteer military, and so I can't make people serve. I have to get the best people. So you're right that men have more upper body strength on average than women, which is, I think, your artillery example. Uh, that is true. However, not all men have more upper body strength than all women. And so if I'm looking for somebody in a particular, I want the best person. If that is a female, that was the upside of making this decision. Mm -hmm. And against that, you have to balance the downside, which is uh, some disruptions having to do with uh, bathrooms and training and things like that. So that was what everybody was doing. Joe came back on behalf of the Marine Corps and said, I would still like some positions. He said, some I go with everybody else, but there's some that I don't. So that was what I was faced with. Um, and so it was only the Marine Corps, and it was only a sliver in the, in the case of the Marine. That's what you're referring to. I just want everybody to be clear about that. They weren't objecting to the whole thing, yeah. and they weren't, they were talking about a piece of the United States Marine Corps. Okay? And um, so then I had to make a decision, and I made a decision to, to not to, to accept their advice in that case because I wanted to make a joint decision, uh, and I thought that the problems that they identified were tractable ones that could be overcome in the course of implementing uh, this. Um, and so, uh, in that case, I overrode them, and I think well, that was the right thing. Now, Joe, later, I, I, just so you don't think these, the, the, that, um, I don't respect Joe Dunford. I made him chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Oh, he he's, was by far and away the most capable officer I've dealt with, and I've been around for a long time. And uh, just a spectacularly decent person. And by the way, he lives in Boston. <laughs> uh, but I didn't agree with him in this particular case, and I'm the boss, so I decided no. Uh, and so that's the way it is. So at, at one point in the, uh, in the book, you, uh, you say one of uh, uh, Joe Dunford's contributions was that he could remember everything that was said in the media. So you didn't have to take notes yeah. and thereby become suspected of gathering material <laughs> for your memoirs. So first, really? Well, it's probably sort of half tongue in cheek, but no, I really, I mean, I, I would look around the situation room and there'd be, you know, those of us sitting at the table, the president at the end of the table, and I'd, and I'd look around and I'd, I don't, and I, there were all these people, these White House people sitting around the quarters. That, and if you want to know, now maybe since you cover the Pentagon, your sources are mostly in the Pentagon, but for White House reporters and other CBS reporters and so forth, you bet your bottom dollar that their sources on what was said in that room come from those people sitting around the edges, probably sometimes from people sitting in the ta uh, at the table. And that was not Ash Carter. And I wanted that clear to President Obama. So the very first time I went in as Secretary of Defense to the sit room, I put my hands on top of my, the notebook, and, I, and he noticed, and I wanted him to notice. I'm not sitting here writing all this down so that I can write, later write a different book. The book, if you uh, read the book that's, this, that uh, is out there at the bookstore, it's not a memoir. I would never write a memoir like that. I would never write about what he said. And if anybody who worked for me did that to me, I would, I would consider it a betrayal. Because you can't function as a leader if you can't sit down and discuss things with people. And you're worried that what somebody said was going to show up in the newspaper. And the one thing I promised Obama was that I wouldn't leak on him. And I, and I told him that I'd, I would be happy to speak first. And I did, because the other thing people do, they wait. Because nobody wants to be the first one to say something. They want to hang back and see where everybody else is. That doesn't help the president. 
He's sitting there. This is a guy who's doing a million things of which foreign policy and defense policy is just one. And I'm supposed to be helping him. So I would always willing to throw the first pitch. Didn't bother me at all. Mm. I'd sit there and he'd say, he'd, 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 he'd open the topic and then he'd look around and everybody looked, people looked down like this, waiting to see what somebody else would say. And I, sometimes I'd say, Mr. President, I'm happy, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. And I'd say, I'd say one way you might think about this is X, and one way you may get where you want to go is Y, and I try to offer him. So, by the way, Joe Dunford was excellent at this, excellent at exactly that. And I wouldn't sit there and scratch down everything he said. And I, so I was doing all that for a very good reason. And so I wouldn't have written a book like that. It also happens that I couldn't have written a book like that, David, because I don't remember things that way. I'm a physicist, which means I remember the meaning of things and not the words of things. And so I remember what the president concluded and kind of what his intent was, but I didn't remember the words. And Joe had a, had a better memory than me, so every once in a while I would say to him, hey, Joe, do you remember exactly how he phrased something? And Joe would invariably be able to recon re, uh, reconstruct. Um, but it's, it's, it's part of an environment of trust, and I thought the president was entitled uh, uh, to that, and I, I don't think you can really function. Otherwise, the natural reaction of presidents or leaders anyway is to take things into smaller and smaller decision circles. And I, I don't want that, and I certainly don't want myself to be excluded from this decision circle, because I think I can help him, and I want to help him. So I want, to, I want him to trust me, and I worked hard that he would, I, he didn't always like what I said, but at least he trusted it was coming from a good place that it wasn't going to show up in the newspaper uh, the following morning. And to me, that's just take a job in public service. You're supposed to do it right, and that's doing it right. Joe Dunford did have the, the most amazing recall of the most casual conversations. I couldn't tell you when the first time I, I met him was, but I bet you if you walked up to him cold on the street and asked him when was the first time he met me, he'd not only tell you, but he'd tell you exactly what each of us said. It's just a, uh, an incredible uh, recall. But you know what he can also do, if I just put another pitch for Joe? J Joe was one of these people that I tried to be to the president, but Joe, it, it just is in him. He, when he offered a solution or a recommendation, David, it was so whole. You know, every, every, you, sometimes you have people, advisors, and they will only advise from their, from their narrow little perch, or um, they will, um, uh, they, they will not have thought through all aspects of it, and they'll just tell you one little phrase or something, and, and then you're, you're left at the end of the meeting. You're the guy in charge, let's say, this is in the National Security Council meeting. There's a decision meeting in the Pentagon, so I'm sitting there at the end of the table. Will somebody please help me? This is a difficult problem. I'd like somebody to put themselves in my shoes, and what do I do? And I, I can't do pieces of it. They're all pieces. I can't do pieces. I have to do everything. And I'd like for someone to put themselves in my shoes. Joe Dunford does that so beautifully. And he'd, 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 he'd give you something you could really go with that was a you know, sophisticated, grown-up uh, solution to something you were grappling with. He's truly amazing. Let me get uh, back uh, for a moment to um, women in combat. Um, when James Mattis became Secretary of Defense, he said that his number one priority was to increase the lethality of American forces. And he said, uh, maybe not on the record because he knew it was unpopular, but he, he made it very clear that he did not appreciate social engineering mm -hmm. in the military that would 
reduce the lethality of, of forces. And he was talking specifically about transgenders, and he was talking specifically about women in, in combat. So how do you how do you balance lethality with <coughs> well, you're talking about two different things. You talk, maybe he was talking about two different things, David. You got two different things going there. Um, lethality is good. I'm sorry to say that's our job, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. So if he's, he's for that, that's fine. Um, what matters, so, but now you got on to personnel issues. There, we have an all-volunteer force. One of the most important responsibilities you have to the future as Secretary of Defense is to make sure that you populate it with people who are as excellent as the people who are there now. And that's not a birthright. They're, they're, we compete in labor markets for qualified people. It's an all-volunteer force. People have to want to come to us. I don't have a draft. I can tell you why I don't want a draft. Um, and so I need the best qualified person. And uh, that, the preeminence of military qualifications is the basis on which I made the decision about women in service. To do other than make a decision, a decision on personnel policy on the basis of the most qualified people for our military, that would be social policy. So you not only have it wrong, you have it upside down. Other than that, what do you think? Other than that, it was uh, a great lead in. No. <laughs> His, his, uh, his point was take transgender. That Oh, wait, that's a different transgender. Transgender in all seriousness, this is, these are serious things. You can't lump transgender with, 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 with gender. That's an error already. They're, they're completely different things. I, we I, have know, a I, know when di I know when I'm licked. Wait, wait, the, can I say something else yeah. about people? So you mentioned women, you mentioned transgender. One thing you haven't mentioned it's probably more important even than the women in service thing is our, is our geographic issues. Um, we have a very large fraction of our recruits who come from only six states. Now, that's, I, I, they're great people, and you might say, why is that? It's the states where we have the most bases. So naturally, they are more exposed to military life. But to me, that means that there are 44 other states where we are not having a good enough shot at getting good people. So it's another talent management thing. In today's world, you have to get the very best. So to me, if I were still there, I'd be working on that. Now, if you want to call that social policy, you go ahead, David. But to me, it's getting the best people in our military. and. Uh, I, I wouldn't, so, and, and all these things are different. By the way, another one is getting the right skill sets. We need cyber people. We need, you want to call that social policy? Getting cyber people to serve in the, in the military. I'm looking for the best qualified people I can get that feel the best volunteer force for America I can. So it is the most lethal uh, it can be. So that's what I'm up to. If you're up to something else, then that's social policy. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to whoever uses that, um, that social policy. That's a baloney argument. So we've got about a, a half hour left, and uh, we've reserved that for questions from the audience. Um, I don't know. I, I, I have trouble uh, seeing you out there. I don't know if I can call on you, but somebody will come to you with a mic. Okay. And. Oh, I see the mic, yeah. And we just asked for questions, not speeches. Okay, uh, thank we you. We also can't see a thing. So. That's okay, here I am. So uh, thank you, Secretary. Appreciate it very much that you've come here to speak with us. A question about Russia. Uh, Russia's been an adversary of ours going back a long time. And it looked for a while that it was hopeful that we would if not be friends, at least we could ratchet down the uh, adversarial relationship. And today, with the aggressiveness of Russia, their annexation of the Crimea, 
and they're meddling all over the place, including in our elections. And most importantly, what I want to ask about is their development of these so-called super wet weapons. You know, under the sea, uh, torpedoes that can go forever, undetectable, and these hypersonic weapons that they're developing. First of all, are these real or are these propaganda? And second of all, are we in a position to deter that type of a threat uh, to this country? Uh, they are real. Um, they've been around for actually a, a while. Yes, we are capable of doing what we have always been capable of doing as long as the, the Russians, as long as Moscow has been able to destroy the United States, which has been since the late 50s. Thank you. And that is to threaten to destroy them back. Now, these things are a little fancier, mm -hmm. and I know Putin goes on TV and so From a purely nuclear deterrence point of view, they don't add a lot. Now, it comes in a sub, it comes in a torpedo, a, an undersea torpedo. It's a pretty expensive way to deliver a bomb since he has hundreds of ballistic missiles that can do the same thing and do it in a half an hour and, and are a lot less expensive. So the, this is more. And I have no way of protecting us. I wish I did, but I. Mm -hmm. But we don't. We've we've tr worked on missile defenses as long as I have been in defense, um, and we can do a good job against, say, North Korea, but we don't know how to protect ourselves against uh, the Russians except by threatening to destroy them back. And if he has some new gizmo, it doesn't really change the game very much. What does change the game, and I just need to say this, and more concerning to me, is the little green men, it's called hybrid warfare, which you saw, you see in eastern Ukraine and in the Baltics, people showing up who pretend not to be Russians or pretend to be locals and who aren't. And I'm not confused by that, but many people get confused about whether that's a Russian invasion or not. And so it, in democracies like ours, it becomes harder to argue for what is actually going on. And similarly with cyber, where people get confused, or they start arguing among, among themselves rather than arguing with the Russians about what is essentially an assault upon our country. That's what happened in 2016. Mm -hmm. He attacked our country, and we fought with one another rather than fighting back to him. And that's the reason that he could get away with that is that, our pe is that people make a category error. They don't look at that as an attack. It's, it, it becomes something else because it's cyber and they get all confused. And likewise, the little green men allows some people who maybe don't want to believe it anyway or don't want to take steps to. So those I were those little green men and cyber in Putin's hands. I worry about more than these gizmos, which are not fundamentally different in what they can do to us than things he already has. Now, what they can do is fearsome, but it doesn't add that much to do it in the terms of. So I wouldn't. I, I, I don't think they create a qualitatively new threat from Russia. And then finally, you're right, Russia didn't turn out the way we wanted. And if you, uh, for me, I, that was clear around 2000. By the way, China didn't turn out the way we wanted either. No. <laughs> um, that, but they turned out the way they turned out. You want to know what Putin thinks, listen to what he says. And you want to know what Xi Jinping thinks, listen to what he says. And neither of these guys is particularly uh, concealing of their, their, their ambitions. And what they regard as the reasonable way to lead their country into the future is a way that is in, is, is in certain respects inimical to our interests. And we need to protect ourselves. Thank you. So, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank you so much for your service to the country, thank you. Secretary. Um, two quick questions. Um, one of them, as you know, we've pulled out of the Iran peace deal. Um, how long can we go, and what can we do to stop Iran, now that we're not a part of the deal, for continuing to build nuclear weapons? Um, well, I... Uh, was a supporter of the Iran 
nuclear deal, let me make clear, and I can say later why that is. But remember that Iran nuclear deal was not a grand bargain. It was purely a nuclear deal. In all other respects, Iran's behavior didn't have to change and was, in my judgment, not going to change. And Iran is trouble in many, many ways. It didn't change what we did, the agreement in the Defense Department, because the morning after it was signed, I sat down with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, asked me what, our, my, what his instructions were, and I said, don't do anything differently. I want to continue to have the ability to destroy the, the Iranian nuclear program ourselves, if we have to, if they change course. And I want, still want to have 64,000 US troops in the Gulf. All the stuff we've traditionally done. Because all this does is remove one little headache, if they abide by it. Uh, all right, then we signed it. And as typical happens in, in, in the United States throughout our history, what one administration signs late in an administration gets repudiated by the next administration. So this, this, the, the president, President Trump, that is, um, had promised to, and then, then kept his promise, to uh, take us out of the treaty. And the, there we find ourselves. Now, um, uh, so we have to pick ourselves up and move on from here. And that, that, that is what it is. It hasn't been as bad as it might have been because the Iranians for about two years continued to hope that we would change course again um, and therefore did not press forward as they otherwise might have. Now they're doing more of that now so they may have concluded that we're really not coming back but we got a couple of years there. The other thing that they had to do it early in the life of the treaty was dismantle some stuff they'd already done. And we, they did that, thinking that we would stay in the treaty. So we kind of got that as a freebie. Okay. Um, and that set them back further than they otherwise would have. So, so far, it has been okay. I would, again, I would have preferred to stay in because I think I'd, I'd, I'd like not to have Iran, with which I have so much other trouble also have nuclear weapons or keep, keep making me plan for them to have nuclear weapons. Because as Secretary of Defense, I have to look ahead and say, OK, now these guys may have a nuclear weapon. That creates a new headache for me, and I just soon not have it. But we're doing OK so far. One other quick question. Um, based upon the alleged, whatever word you want to use, bribery of President Zelensky with holding back the $400 million in military funds. Do you think that that truly impacted our defense? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to answer that in a sort of very general way. I don't want to get in right in the middle of the whole, whole impeachment thing. Oh, for I the agree. following reason, Ash Carter has views about that. But I'm not real close to it now. And one of the things I really tried to do when I was Secretary of Defense, and I've tried to be respectful of that, since Secretary of Defense, he was in charge of loose nukes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. The current administration claims that the prior administration was too weak in their support of Ukraine. So I'm wondering if you could talk to that. There was a, I, 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 I understand that people say that. There were people in, at the time, who, who said that. And uh, that is the razor's edge that I was just talking about. There have always been people who have wanted us to do more, mm -hmm. and there all, have always been people who said, if you push it too far, you'll tip the Russians. In, in, so that's been going on since 1994, actually. And it's not so a Democrat versus Republican. We tend to think of everything as being Democrats versus Republicans these days. Most things are not that way, really. And this is not one that's raged. And it raged within the Obama administration. It probably raged within the Trump administration. I can't say, because I'm not there. Um, and every administration before that, people argue, would argue or different things with respect to Ukraine. One, if I can just tell a little story. I'm not sure it's in the book or not. But I remember going with President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton to Ukraine for the first time an American president had ever been in an independent Ukraine. 
And we were standing there in front of Mariansky Palace at night, and the presidents are standing up there. Beautiful, beautiful. This is a beautiful uh, palace there in Kiev. And down two rows are the two delegations. And I'm standing next to Mrs. Clinton, Hillary Clinton. And then our staffs are standing behind us. And they play the American national anthem, and then they play the Ukrainian national anthem, which is really beautiful. And um, I, over my right shoulder, I hear weeping. And it's one of Hillary Clinton's uh, staffers. And I later, I, I turned to her, I said, I heard you crying at the, what, what was going on. She said, I am a Ukrainian American. I grew up in Chicago. I went to a Ukrainian American school every morning we sang that anthem, and I never, ever thought I'd see it, see it here. So in the emigre community here in the United States, like in so many others, Polish and Armenian and so forth, uh, in the United States, uh, they, uh, the feelings are very strong. So the Ukrainian thing is like, I, you shouldn't be surprised when you see people arguing back and forth about how much we do for Ukraine. I don't like to see it get mixed up with other things, but debate over what to do with Ukraine is not new, it's old. As I remember, you were in favor of doing more. I was, I, I, and President Obama didn't take my advice. So I, most of the time he took my advice, I'm happy to say, but not all the time. And, and this is a case where he didn't take it. Thank you for being here today. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, I have a question about nuclear non-proliferation. Um, specifically about the U.S. pulling out of the INF and the Trump administration saying it won't renew the START II treaty in 2021. Um, so is it in the United States' defense interests to produce more nuclear weapons? And if not, how does the United States contribute to nonproliferation in a world where these treaty frameworks don't exist? Well, I'm glad to hear you ask the question because uh, we've talked about Syria, we've talked about women in service, we've talked about all, ki uh, all kinds of things. But David appropriately raised nuclear weapons early on. You know, they're not in the newspapers a lot. And, and I always tell people, the day when nuclear weapons are in the newspaper, we're in real trouble. These things alone, of every th everything else we have, everything else is reparable. But you start using nuclear weapons, and you have, I mean, you, you really have to do that. I'm a physicist. And, I, this is, you poison a place way beyond Chernobyl for a long time with one bomb. So you can never forget that this is a fearsome thing. And so any nuclear thing has to be dealt with with a lot of gravity. So good on you for asking the question. And I, it's a serious question. And I, the, the INF Treaty, for those of you who don't know, Intermediate, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, Treaty is one of the treaties we signed with the then Soviet Union, um, which was an important part, a uh, way of damping down the Cold War and making sure we didn't blow each other to smithereens. And so a very important thing, nothing more important in those days than doing that. Um, I, it, 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 it's, we have now, uh, decided that we don't value being in the INF treaty in the same way. And that's actually true, uh, if I may say so. Uh, I don't, um, it's not as big a deal now as it used to be. And in fact, I have to tell you that as the Secretary of Defense, I occasionally looked longingly at what I might be able to do if I didn't have that treaty stopping me. Not nuclear but missiles for other purposes, for example, China. And so I could make good use of the absence of the INF treaty if I had to, and I wouldn't fall on my sword for it. I think the real, the, the best answer I can give to your question is, we need to be in contact with the Russians. And you, we're not dealing, they're a nuisance, and Putin is, a real headache, but he is, he's out there. And so I am in favor 
of being in constant dialogue, even with our It can be controversial in the United States, and people have say, you know, should we talk to Kim Jong-un? And my answer to that is, well, it depends on what you say. I don't object to you talking to him. I'm a little sensitive to what you say. So I'd like to be talking to Putin. Um, and I, and I, if I were talking to him about the INF Treaty, I said, I said, I said, I don't want it more than you do, pal. So you're violating it now, which he is. And um, so tell me what you think. And if you don't want it, fine. Maybe we'll get rid of that, because it really is quite old now. And, and why don't we think about something that we can do that makes sense together? Um, because nuclear weapons are they're not things to toy around with. Around with. And we, 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 much as we dislike, uh, I dislike what he does uh, in many ways, um, I can't afford to break contact with him or thumb my nose at him or push it when it comes to nuclear weapons. It's just not safe. Thank you. Thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, on the topic of missiles, a lot has been made recently in the news um, about a lot of land-based missiles being developed in China that potentially have the capabilities of hitting U.S. bases uh, yeah. such as Guam or even U.S. aircraft carriers. Um, at the same time, we know that the current aircraft carrier under production is suffering from a lot of budget concerns being pushed back multiple years. Um, do you think these missile developments in China how much, of, how much are they a threat to either U.S. Uh, land bases or the U.S. Navy? Um, and are. what steps should the Navy take well, to counteract are. those they're developments? A and they're a problem, and they're exactly what I meant. I can't do the same to yeah. them because of the INF Treaty, which is a deal made with the Russians a <clears> long time <throat> ago for a totally different purpose, <clears throat> which is why I would tell Vladimir Putin, <laughs> you don't want it more than I want it. Because if we get out of the IDF Treaty, I'll, I know what I'll be doing tomorrow, uh, which is d designing missiles exactly like that to go back at the Chinese. Um, now, they've been at this for quite a, quite a while. Um, uh, it was something I'd like not to have to deal with. We do know how to deal with it. It's nuisance and expensive. So if you look at Guam now, and you look at the DF-21 or other missiles that they can use against Guam, that's one of the reasons why we have a missile system called THAAD, which we deployed on Guam, is to defend our forces on Guam from uh, these uh, missiles, aircraft carriers, another, uh, another uh, uh, example. And so, you know, China used to be a place you didn't have to worry about all that much in the 1990s. It was weak, and we didn't pay that much of, much attention. And when they caused trouble for somebody else, like Taiwan in 1998, when they were firing missiles on either side, we, you'll remember this, sent aircraft carriers right into the Taiwan Strait. And it drove them nuts, because they, they didn't even know where the aircraft carriers were. Today they would. Today they would. So they're, they're, they're Getting, it's okay. I think we still know how to deal with it, but I would. Uh, it was easier then than it is now. Thank you. I've heard a lot of people say that China really got serious about its uh, armed forces after those carriers, and they realized that there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. Yeah, all the China experts say that, that that's exactly right. That was a humiliating thing. And in fact, I remember Chu Haotian was the Chinese defense minister then, and he came to the Pentagon. Uh, he, had, he had a long scheduled visit, and then that event happened, and two weeks later he found himself in the United States, um, humiliated by what we had done. And I remember he said to Bill Perry, who was my boss at the time, he said, uh, 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 I lost face as a consequence. Well, he didn't build me. He's a very practical person. He just said, well, well, you deserve to lose face. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's a beautiful answer. He's just, 1996, for Christ's sake, you can't fire missiles around people's territory. So if you lost face, it's your fault, uh, is what our then Secretary of Defense, I think, perfectly appropriately said to them, but they remember that kind of thing. All right. Hi, Secretary. Thank you again for being here. 
Um, so switching gears a little bit, I know we've been veering away from politics, but at least from a geopolitical perspective, and I know that you're the director of the Belfort Center at, um, at Harvard, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, it was alarming to me, and I'm no expert in international relations, but that there's been a, a rise of authoritarian, authoritarianism uh, globally, whether it's with Vladimir Putin, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Erdogan, and some would even say here in the U.S., um, but do you find it to be alarming, this, this rise in authoritarianism, um, or is it just the, the natural course of, of politics? Well, yeah, no, I, 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 I don't like it. I mean, I hope, we all thought in the 1990s, remember the end of history, and it was all going our way, and everybody was going to be democratic. Well, don't look, you don't, can't look around the world now and think things are going your way. But if you're asking me, is that my way, that's, that's my way. Now, speaking for myself, I'm old-fashioned, and I believe in the Enlightenment, and I believe in good old American values, uh, which, which, let me remind you, are not American values. This is an important thing with respect to the Chinese. Um, uh, at our best, and in our founding institutions and so forth, we echo the Enlightenment phrase what they call the dignity of man. We would say the dignity of humans or something now. But the dignity of man, not the dignity of Americans, not the dignity of Frenchmen, not the dignity of Englishmen, the dignity of man. And, um, you know, I, I like to think we still are that and stand for that. And I only say that because this is not to denigrate China, but the Chinese agenda is about being Chinese. Uh, it, it is, and they don't have anything to say about people who are not Chinese. It's, it's all about being Chinese, which is fine. They're entitled to be Chinese. Want to do, but then you say, well, can you say a little something about how all the rest of us fit in? And we don't. And so I like the Western tradition. I really believe it. And, and you're right. We live in an era when you need to stick up for... Um, and you can't take it for granted anywhere. Thank you. I know we've got other people in line, but we're, we're down to our last five minutes, and, and there's one uh, story I want to get out of uh, Ash Carter um, before we leave. Th these jobs at the top of the uh, uh, Defense Department are killer jobs, and, and the public only sees a tiny, tiny fraction of, of what they entail. Every time a missile is launched anywhere in the world, it's detected by an infrared satellite which sets off alarms in command centers all around the world and immediately a conference call is convened. And usually it's a very short call because there's no real threat and it's handled by staffers. But throughout 2017, when the North Koreans were testing those long-range missiles, the Secretary of Defense, James Mattis then, was on every one of those calls. And he was on those calls because, one, there was at least a possibility that it was a real threat either to the homeland or to U.S. troops overseas. And two, he needed the practice of how you are going to make these world-changing decisions about what you do about that threat in the space of just a very few minutes. And I'm sure Ash Carter has been on any number of those phone calls. But reading his book reminded me that another phone call the Secretary of Defense gets is when a civilian aircraft intrudes into a restricted airspace like the nation's capital. And I want to ask you to tell that story. That's harder. The, the one you describe is, for me, easy. I don't want to speak for Jim. By the way, I've known Jim Mattis for 25 years. He and I are friends, just in full disclosure. I thought he did a good job. Um, but if the North, if North Koreans are firing him missile the United States, uh, I know what to do. I'm going to shoot it down. That's not a hard one. 
at the real, at the, so that's the easy end of the hard end of the spectrum. The hard end of the spectrum is somebody's firing nuclear weapons at you. Um, and we could deal with that one another time. In between is the one that, that David's raising, which is an airliner is coming towards the capital. Uh, should we shoot it down or not? That I lived with, and my wife is here also and remembers that. And you remember that every minute, because it is, it is not a no-brainer. The nuclear and the missile defense are cleaner, put, this, put it that way. Nuclear escape, help the president escape, keep him alive, get a decision out of him later. The North Koreans are firing missiles. Well, for God's sake, shoot them down. Do you really need to come to my level to know that? In between is the airliner. And I've had that experience, and I think Steph will remember, I think it was one of my first nights. It, that This is a responsibility that is, that uh, only the secretary, that the president has delegated to the secretary and the deputy sec, and, and the deputy secretary of defense only. Remember, we cannot shoot nuclear missiles. Only the president can do that. He does not delegate that. But this, he delegates. And he says, okay, if I'm giving a speech, you shoot down the airliner. <laughs> so um, that happens all the time. It's not rare. Uh, and it looks a lot more, a nothing else is like a ballistic missile. Mm -hmm. Every dentist in his Cessna going for a ride on the weekend looks like an airliner attacking the, uh, the Capitol Dome. And so it happens again and again, and it happens, it's worse when the president travels around the country because he takes a little bubble with him, and they never, the civil aviators especially, never remember where he is. And we have the capability, without going into detail, to intercept, shoot down. And Washington, David knows all this perfectly well. So one night, middle of the night, the security office, the security detail, which has rented a nearby apartment, which they always do, and so they're in there, and they come down the hall and thrust a phone into my hand. And here's what was going on. It, a, airplane had that was supposed to go to land at uh, Baltimore's Baltimore Washington International Airport had instead overflown the airport and was heading toward the dome of the Capitol and uh, was not responding to uh, radio uh, attempts to communicate with it so I got on, and of course, on this phone call, as David indicates, in this case, are, are the FAA, but also the FBI and the CIA and all of our people. Um, but you're the one who's going to make the call. And we had already scrambled some F-16s, which can be done on a lower level authority. Um, and they were uh, ascending, and they came near the aircraft and tried to get this guy's attention, firing flares in front of the and saying, you know, dude, wake up and pay attention to what's going on. And no change in the trajectory. So finally I said, okay, w the next step, which is bump them, which is you go up there in the fighter and you fire your exhaust at them and makes them jump around. So finally that gets a response from this. Do you know what it is? The, the, the pilot was the only one who was on the flight deck and he had fallen asleep. And he's flying a cargo aircraft foreign flag. So I'm this far from shooting this guy down. And, you know, imagine that as an airliner filled with people. I mean, it's a no-win situation, those kind of things. You can't have somebody flying into the dome of the Capitol and destroying a place that has been continuously illuminated since the Civil War. And you can't kill 200 people in an airliner either, uh, lightly. So it is, it's an ugly duty, and you're, it's at you all the time. And you can only trade it between the secretary and the deputy. So we'd say, you know, if somebody's going out to dinner or something, they'd say, you're O-N-E tonight. O-N-E stands for Operation Noble Eagle. And then, you know, so if Leon Panetta was his deputy, we're going out to 
to one of that Italian restaurant he liked downtown, he'd say, you're O-N-E. Okay, I'm O-N-E, and that means I'm paying extra attention, and I'm going overseas, he's on O-N-E. And I would do it when I was secretary and had deputies, um, too, and I, I hope for all of our sakes that uh, uh, nothing ever happened. But we came close again and again and again. And it, uh, it's something that just goes on all the time. You probably don't know it. And I hope we continue to avoid shooting somebody down or having somebody ram into the president's helicopter when he's moving or something, something like that. It's a serious business. And he also had to worry about getting his uh, picture taken with Jane Fonda. It's a tough job. <laughs> don't so, do it. <laughs> so we've uh, actually run over our time. Uh, so thank you, everyone.